another tablet? Or do you want to talk? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Orby, I didn't see your hand. <laughs> from the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verses 16 through 19 that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with the power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height, and the depth, and to know that the love of Christ, which surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I'm 
thank you for the blessings that you give us. We thank you for how you provide for us in every way that we need it. We thank you for the opportunity to give back out of the abundance that you've given us. And we pray, Father, that this offering is pleasing and glorifying to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. She got to go home. Her blood pressure was good. They said, long as she's good for a couple days, she could go home. And I just don't know when, but she's going to get an appointment at University of Washington Hospital. Mm -hmm. And I think they still hope maybe she could have a liver someday. But she, she'd she been, uh, I think she'd been in that intensive care unit for about a month. Oh. About a month. So she was so happy to be home. So mm -hmm. that's a report about her. <clears throat> and let's see. Uh, did you get to go visit Helen, Sarah? No, I didn't go. Oh, you didn't get to go, okay. And uh, we was praying last week for Pastor uh, Phil's uh, wife. I think Pastor Linda already told you about that. And Bobby, what about your brother Bobby? Know anything about him? He's home. Home, Bobby's home. Bobby, Bobby Howard was in the hospital. Huh? He's come over visiting Wonderful. That was great, great. And then uh, I had uh, Dan Thurber on here. He lost his wife, Paula. They were on vacation of all places. And, 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 and they found her dead. And she's just in her early 50s. Maybe not even middle 50s, I don't think. So. And my brother Dennis had been in the hospital. Now, last I heard, they're gonna, uh, he went to a doctor and they're going to do an MRI. They're trying to find out what, what went wrong with him. Some, someone told me a story that they thought he'd had a uh, mini stroke. Oh. Yeah, I heard that much. So they want to, uh, I guess, do a better checkup on him. He's going to get an MRI. I think I'm not uh, You know, Fred Miller, his yeah. son Johnny died. I saw that on Facebook. Yeah. Did it, it never said why, did it? I don't know if they didn't know, I'm sure. They found him in, in the bed. And I think Fred had just moved in with him to live with him. And I think he sold his house. Well, I saw, it, I saw that on Facebook too, where uh, Fred had sold his house. Yeah. So I said, well, he had two sons and a daughter, so he's going to move in with somebody. You yeah. think it was John? Yeah, oh, he moved in with John. Oh, that's so sad. That's so sad. Chris doing? Huh? How's your Chris doing? He's doing good. Uh, still goes to therapy three times a week, but he's planning on coming to his aunt's, uh, aunt's house, that's his aunt, in, uh, for 4th of July. Oh. So we'll have, get to have a good, uh -huh. we're going to go down, oh. and the girls, and uh, we'll have a good get together down there for the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I told you this last week, but you guys right in here, he took some kind of a test. Uh, I guess the lady came from um, Lysom bureau I guess and she had a car the, that you drove with everything up here Oh, because uh, he wants to learn he wanted to be able to drive their big van Oh, because uh -huh. there's times that well school will be starting in August and his wife will go back to school uh -huh. and and his mother-in-law's not always able he'd uh -huh. like to drive himself to therapy oh so he done good he passed he passed oh that's good so Chris, uh, Chris is doing good <clears throat> we can't wait to see him uh, 
He's got to do therapy on Friday, so he'll come down to Ed, he'll come to Ed's house on Friday, mm -hmm. stay a couple couple nights and visit with us. That'll be that'll, that'll be, just be great. Did you put John Wrenches on there? Did you say John had a, a mini stroke? Or um, Tina told me that I think he did. Yeah, John did. John Wrenches. I put John on here. That was like one day last week, I think, Gladys. Yeah. He's good. Now he's on medicine to prevent that from happening again. <clears throat> okay. Is there any others? Uh, Karen had surgery, which I forgot to mention to yeah. put on the prayer list last week. Oh. She had a, a Friday, and one good thing out of it, they didn't have to use a builder cup. Okay. And so they repaired the where it was tore and took the uh, spurs off and she was they told her she'd be in a lot of pain yesterday and she was she but, was uh, she was she's, she's doing okay though shoulder well that's good she'll just heal faster she didn't have to have yeah. have so much uh, done right oh yeah i remember you told me last week about that <clears throat> yeah but all these uh, these little notes here i think i got them all we had so, we had so many names brought up last week um, I hear Bobby Howard, who lost his wife. Yeah. Uh, you want to get that on or take that off? You go ahead and take that off now if you want to. Yeah. Because it's been quite a while. Yeah. That might give you some space there. Yeah. Yeah, that, could, that would be all right. Did you guys have a nice vacation? Oh, yeah. Very good. good. Yeah, it was nice. Very good. I'm glad you got to go. We like to pray for Tom. He hasn't been here uh, for quite some time. Says he's having trouble sleeping. I asked him if it's because of vomit or pain, and he says a little of both. Okay. Okay. Is there any others? Okay. Let's take these to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day and the cool, refreshing air, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for our trip to uh, uh, the college, to Franklin College. And Lord, we especially thank you for safety, for the, for the ride there and the ride home. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And Lord, we want to pray for Cindy, our driver, she was a good driver, Lord, and she's going to have surgery in the morning. Yes. Cindy's going to have hip surgery. So we pray, Lord, you'll just watch over Cindy, bring her through her surgery, and we pray for quick healing. Thank you, Lord. And we're so thankful that Diane Allen is home, Lord. I know she's happy to be home after being away a month, being there with her dad. And I just pray she keeps uh, her exercise level up and and uh, that she soon gets her... Uh, appointment at the University of Washington to see what they could do for her, Lord. Thank you. And uh, so sad for for Fred Miller to lose his son, Johnny, for all the family, Lord. We just uh, pray, Lord, they look to you for understanding. Thank you, Lord. And we pray for John Lynch's having the mini stroke. We just pray, Lord, this is will be a wake-up call to John, Lord, to take good care of yourself, take his medicines on time, and Lord, we thank you for watching over John. Thank you, Lord. And we're so thankful that Karen came through her surgery much better than she thought in the beginning. Now we pray for healing, Lord. We pray that she's quickly able to do all the therapy and everything they'd have her to do to get well. Thank you, Lord, for watching over Karen. And we pray for Tom Zimmerman. And we pray for any of our other uh, family here, Lord, at church. It's just not here today. Sometimes we don't even know the reason why, Lord. We pray at home, Lord, that they're still, still praying to you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now be with our pastor. We're so thankful that he had a safe trip and a wonderful trip. We pray for him, Lord, as he uh, gives a message today. Let each one of us, Lord, listen 
and help us to understand, Lord. In thy precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Dan, last week, Pastor had her message laying here. Uh -huh. When I got done, I just picked up everything and went to my seat. <laughs> we really had a good laugh. <laughs> She's searching and searching for her, for her message. <laughs> Thinking somebody's pranking her, but they're not. Oh, no, I looked down, I thought, this is awfully thick here in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Samson. And we see that the angel of the Lord came to his mother and told him that told her that she was she was barren and told her that she was going to have a child. Now she was told by the angel of the Lord that she would have a son. Now we have people that were announced by angels in scripture. We have Isaac, we have John the Baptist, we have Jesus that was announced by angels and Samson, who was foretold by the angel of the Lord that there would be a child to be born. Samson being the least of these by far. And he told the mother that he was to be a Nazarite 
and that she would basically be starting off <coughs> the valve herself because he told her that she could have no products of the vine, of the grapevine, no fermented drink, and she was, I told her that she wasn't supposed to eat anything that would defile her. So she had to really stay strict to the Mosaic law on what her dietary would be. But no razor was to touch his hair and nothing for him later would be no razor to his hair and nothing again of the grapevine, any fermented drink. And this was to be that you wouldn't have any wine because you were to get any artificial stimulant that would be maybe likened to joy, being, you know, you get those happy drunks. So don't want any of that. So it was your joy was to be completely in the Lord. There was to be nothing else that would stimulate any happiness and joy but the Lord himself. And he was not to be near any dead body carcass, animal, person, anything, even if there was to be a person in your family that was to die, you weren't to go to the funeral. You were supposed to be completely away from any dead body. So in the end of chapter 13, it says the woman gave birth to a boy and named him <laughs> Samson and he grew and the Lord blessed him. So that's how we wrapped up chapter 13. But going into 14, we have a gap. There's going to be about 14, about 20 years of a gap from his birth into this point, And we see that Samson wants a wife. So Samson, it says that in the beginning of chapter 14, it says, went down to Timnah and saw there a young Philistine woman. <coughs> when he returned, he said to his father and mother, I have seen a Philistine woman in Timnah, now get her for me as a wife. So this is his demand of his parents. Get me this woman as my wife. So his parents immediately are going to question this. Like, why do you want this woman? Why do you want a Philistine woman? Can't you find a good Jewish girl? So they want, you're not supposed to be marrying outside of their faith. But he says, she is right in my eyes. And this goes along with kind of the cycle in Judges. They did what was right in their own eyes. So this is a big cycle that we go through, the cycle of sin. This is part of it. Doing something just because this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do. We see as we go along with Samson that he's driven by lust, he's driven by flesh, he's driven by this is what I want, this is what I'm going to do. And we're taught out in Deuteronomy, if I remember correctly, they weren't supposed to marry outside the faith because you end up compromising. That's just the way it goes. In any marriage, no matter how great it is, there's always compromise. But if you're marrying into a pagan faith, it's going to be the ones who aren't pagan who go the other direction. It's generally not the other way. So there's going to be more compromise, and that's what happened to Israel. They started marrying outside the faith, and they slide into the pagan beliefs and following that direction, which sets them up for destruction. But we see here with him marrying a Philistine woman or going to look for a Philistine woman that God is setting up to pick a fight. He wants to deliver them. So how are you going to do it? You're going to pick a fight. He's going to pick a fight with the Philistines with Samson. But we see Samson's character here demanding of his parents. I want this woman. Get me this woman. They could have refused. They could have just said no. But he's like, I want this. I want this. And we see that Samson really never matures past about 14 years old. Howdy, I want this, I want this. So what would have to do is parents would have to arrange this and they would have to pay the dowry to this woman's father. And the, actually dowry, I came across a description of the dowry is more kind of like pre-alimony. So if she marries this man and he rejects her, the money that his father 
pays to her father is what is used to take care of her in years to come. So if he rejects her, this money is to sit there and then he can use that to take care of his daughter later on. So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and his mother and he came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him and the spirit of the Lord came on him mightily and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. Though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Well, one, he shouldn't have been in a vineyard anyway because he's not supposed to have anything of the vine. And we see his attitude. We know he was eating grapes. He doesn't say it. I'm putting my money on it that he was eating grapes. Because <laughs> he does everything. He's been doing everything else wrong. He's eating grapes. <clears throat> So this lion comes at him and he says it tore him apart like would one would tear apart a young goat. Now this might be one of those too much, too much information moments, but that when they would get a young goat ready for a meal, you could grab it by its hind legs and you bend them backwards and you get a picture. So that's what he did with this lion. He tore it apart like they would tear apart a young goat. So he doesn't tell his parents what he's been doing because he's doing all these things that are going against the vow that he should be taking or should be honoring. So he talks to this girl. He like, still likes her. He wants her as his wife. Even after his parents have questioned him, even though he's gone, he knows that they're not supposed to be outside the Jewish faith. <clears throat> they agree to it. So when he's going back to Timnah, he notices the lion that he killed is still laying there. And bees have made a comb in the lion and it's full of honey. So he scrapes out a bunch of the honey out of this lion, which gross, I suppose. <laughs> I, what, <laughs> that seems kind of nasty to me, but He's making contact with another dead body again. Says, so his father and his mother went down to the woman and Samson gave a feast. There was young men and Samson gave a feast there for the young men as they used to. <coughs> and it happened when they saw him, they brought out 30 companions to be with him. So they're going to have this bachelor party. So there's 30 men. They bring them in for this feast. And these feasts that they would have, this is all Philistines. So this is going to be a drunken bash, basically. So he's going to have fermented drink and he's going to be going against his vow again. And we see that Samson is physically strong, but morally and spiritually weak. He knows his vow, but he has his blessing that's what he's going with. So at this feast, all of, all of Philistines there, the feast would be seven days long. And then at the end, the, sale, the dowry's already been paid. Everything's been set up. It's ready to go. They have a seven day feast. At the end of that seven days, that's when the marriage would be consummated and then it would be an official marriage. And we see that Samson is basically living as a Philistine. It says then, this is during the feast, then Samson said to them, let me pose a riddle to you. If you can correctly solve it and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. And he said, and they said to him, pose your riddle that we may hear it. So he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat and out of the strong came something sweet. Now for three days, they could not explain the riddle. So they're trying to figure it out. Then they go to his wife, says, you've got to find out this answer. And if you don't find out the answer, we're going to burn you 
and your father's house. So we're going to kill you, and we're going to kill all of your family on top of it. So then Samson's wife wept on him. Some of, some of the translations that she fell on him, weeping. You hate me. You do not love me. You've posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. And Samson responds in a way that you would expect Samson to respond. Says, I didn't tell my parents. Why am I telling you? Just his ego is just over, overflowing with this. And this goes on for days that she's crying on him and just weeping about <coughs> him, just continually badgering him, which basically she would have reason to. She's going to die if she doesn't find out this answer. So after all of this, for days and days of her crying, of her falling on him, weeping about this, she wears him down to get the answer. So as soon as she gets the answer, she goes to the men at the, at the <clears> feast, <throat> and the answer being a lion. So they tell him that, of course, he's going to be really mad at that point. And he says, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would have not have solved the riddle. So he just called his wife a heifer. <laughs> And he's really, really ticked at this point, really mad about this. He says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and when he went down, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of the men, took their apparel, and gave the changes of clothing to those who had explained the riddle. So when he goes down to Ashkelon, the Lord comes upon him, and he goes to Ashkelon. Ashkelon is about 30 miles away. So he's got a little ways to go. It's going to take some time to get there. And then after he goes there, steals, the, kills 30 men, takes their clothes. Then when he's on his way back, he goes to his father's house. He doesn't go back to Timnah. <clears throat> Immediately, he goes back to his father's house. And then while this is all going on, his wife's father gives her to another man. And he doesn't know that this is going on yet. He thinks, I'm just going, I've, I've got the clothes I'm supposed to get, and then I'm going to go to my father's house, I'm going to rest, then I will go get my wife. So it says, after a while, in the time of the wheat harvest, it happened that Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, let me go into my wife, into her room, but her father would not permit him to go in. So at this point, he's bringing a goat, which would kind of be the equivalent of bringing flowers at the time. Yeah. It was just, this is a great, this is a great gift, getting a goat. So it says, her father said, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. So it went to her, his best man, basically. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. <clears throat> or he's like, you don't want this girl anyway. Take her younger sister. She's better. She's better looking. You'll like her better. Just forget about her. Go with this one. So Samson left. The, so basically what happened is Samson left before the feast was over. There's supposed to be the seven days consummation official. He left before the end of the feast. So it wasn't an actual official marriage it was never consummated he went to her father to go in to visit her in her room and he wouldn't let her go in so this is a thing that's called a sadika marriage and this was really common at the time among pagans that they would have a sadika marriage <laughs> and this would be something where the woman would live with her father and then the husband would just come and visit they weren't actually in the same household and this is actually something that some of the Arab nations will still follow this as a pattern of just the husband just comes and visits. They don't live in the same household. So Samson is really, really upset at this point. And Samson said to them, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and caught 300 foxes and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, 
put a torch between each of the pair of their tails, and when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. So we see that the Philistines originally were basically seafaring people. We know that they attacked Egypt. They came back because they got destroyed, beaten really bad by Egypt. They came and they settled along the coast of Israel. This is where they sat and they were, we know that they were into metallurgy. So they were able to make weapons of war and they could make farm implements. So that they were very good farmers. And they had, and this would not only have been their cash crop, but their own supplies. And Samson just destroyed all of that. So they, they, they're looking, who did this and why was this done? They find out it was Samson, and then they find out that he killed these people, and that he burned out their burned out their crops because his father-in-law gave the woman that he wanted for a wife to another man. So they take his father-in-law, his would-be father-in-law, his would-be wife, and they burn them both. A lot of brutal stories in this, in this, in this book. It says, Samson said to them, since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock of Edom. So because these people killed the wife that he still wanted and her father-in-law, he attacks them and kills a whole bunch of other Philistines. And it says that he attacked them hip and thigh. And this would mean that he attacked them with no mercy. And then he went to Edom, which was basically he went back to Judah, back to the land of the Israelites. So he just left. So after he's killed all these people, he's burned out their crops. The Philistines get an army together and they head to Judah. They set up camp in Judah. Then the Israelites come out to meet the Philistines. And they want to know, why are you coming here? There, we have no provocation. We don't know why you're here. What's going on? They said, we want Samson because we're going to kill him. So their response is, hold on, we'll go get him for you. Because <laughs> they would rather have the Philistines on the edge of their land We'll go bring him out so you guys don't come in and tear everything up on the way through. So then there are 3,000 men. They got 3,000 men in Judah, and they went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is, it that, what is this that you have done to us? So we look at this. The Israelites are fine with the Philistines. Don't stir them up. We're fine. We're good. We had we didn't have any problems until you showed up and started killing them and burning their crops out. Just leave them alone. So they're happy living as pagans. They're happy living in sin when Samson could have been their deliverer. He was the one that could set them up to get rid of the Philistines and get them out from under their rule. But they've adapted their lives to living among the pagans. <clears throat> Samson says, I'm just getting my revenge for what's been done to me. So, okay, we're going to bind you and we're going to take you to the Philistines. He agrees to this, but says, don't attack me yourselves. Being that he doesn't want to have to fight his own people. He doesn't want to have to kill his own people. So they take him to the Philistines. And they delivered, as they're delivering him, the Spirit of the Lord again rushes on him. And it says the ropes break off. It was one described that as taking yarn to a flame. They just fell apart. They just snapped. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and reached out his hand. And he took it and killed a thousand men with it. So another carcass tears him up. Now we see this is the first time, after this, this is the first time that Samson will talk to God. He can kind of call it a prayer, I suppose. But he says, 
You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant. And now shall I die of thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? So his first prayer is a complaint. I did this great thing. Now you're going to let me die because I'm thirsty? What's going on here? You didn't provide me with water. I did this great thing, and now you're just going to leave me here? So we see Samson's attitude coming through again, complaining. Not thinking about his blessing that he has, but arrogance. And it says after that, simply, he judged over Israel for 20 years. So the next chapter, getting into chapter 16, would cover his death. I'm not doing that. <laughs> I started off, I had this huge service, this big, long thing going on. I'm half, I was... I was at this point, and I still had a whole other chapter to go. And you can thank Angie once again. <laughs> I said, well, just stop it where you're at. I said, no, you got to finish off his life, the entire thing. I said, no. <laughs> so we're, we're going to break it off here. So Samson was independent. He never had help. He always worked alone. He was not ever thinking about the blessing that what he had was given to him by God. He had confidence in himself. He had no humility. And we see a lot of, in this entire story, a lot of compromise. He compromised his vow. We see his parents that gave in to him because he was whining about, I want this woman, I want this woman. We see Israel that slides into this where they're happy being basically Philistines. We have a slippery slope, we have a slow drift, and they slide into destruction because of their unwillingness to follow the Lord. Israel was fine with this. They had adapted into the culture to the point where you really couldn't tell the difference between Israel and the Philistines. And this is where we can apply it, is in our, in our society, where are we at? Can we tell the difference between our own lives? Are we acting different? Are we talking different? Are we doing things in our lives differently than our society around us? Israel was right in there, and they were happy with it. They were fine to be under the rule of the Philistines, under the rule of the pagans, and not have any problems with it. Don't stir them up. We're fine. We're happy like this. And we see that they never cried out for help. Anywhere earlier in the other chapters, when they were under oppression, when they were having problems, Israel would cry out to the Lord. At some point, they were just like, Lord, get us out of this. And at one point, they actually repented and put away their idols themselves before the Lord came to them. In this instance, God brought them a deliverer without being asked. It was just here, I'm getting you out from underneath to these Philistines. But they never, but when it came to the point where they were going to be out from under them, they didn't want it. Don't stir up the Philistines. Samson was driven by what he wanted. I want this, I want this. He did what was right in his own eyes. Hebrews 10 says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, there is no longer remain a sacrifice for sins. If we know what the truth is and we can deliberately go against it, if we deliberately continue our pattern of sin, how can we be saved out of that? When we're purposely <clears throat> sinning, knowing when we are. And James says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God. To blend in with the world so much, you become an enemy of God. As I've just, as I kept going over this, it boggles my mind that they were under the Philistines and they never asked for help. They never asked to be out from underneath it. And they knew about it because they had lived their lives before that and they knew their forefathers, they knew the Mosaic law, but they never cried out. They were just living among the Philistines. Why do you want to mess with them? We're happy. 
were blending in, but he gave them a deliverer without them asking. Bring them out. He gave them an out. And later on, as kind of comparing this to Jesus, he gives us an out. The Lord gives us an out, not necessarily with us asking, the Lord, give us a savior. Because when they wanted the savior, they wanted someone <laughs> just to destroy Rome so that they could rule. It was all the military. It was one of those, you got the savior you needed, not the one you wanted. So with Jesus' sacrifice, that's where we get our salvation. They were given the opportunity to get out underneath the oppression that they had, but they didn't want to because they were in so much like living as pagans. Hated the light, loved the darkness. You couldn't tell them apart. That's the problem. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your words. We ask, Lord, as we go through our daily lives that you would help us to be, to be set apart. As we have faith in Jesus, you've sanctified us by your Holy Spirit, but help Help us to follow that pattern. Help us to be set apart. Help us to act differently, talk differently, to be different from the world and the society that is around us, that we stand out, that we would seem strange as we should. Hey, Father, we just ask you for the strength to follow the guidance of your Holy Spirit. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we can go into the next song if anybody doesn't have that relationship with the Lord wants to talk about salvation or baptism water's probably pretty decent um, membership any of these things can come forward Oh uh -huh.